the three of us are going to step back and talk about a cacophony of other issues that, um, that we think uh, should be on the president's agenda uh, as the next president takes uh, office. And, and we're not looking to give a laundry list of to-dos. Uh, the whole idea of this conference actually is to try to elevate a little bit and think kind of broader picture uh, so that climate change and these issues don't feel or look like uh, they're, um, you know, not central uh, to, uh, to our economy and to our society. Um, so, uh, and, and then after the, the our, we're each going to talk for 10 or 12 minutes, and then we're, we're going to have a dialogue uh, the, among the three of us. And one of the things I, I hope we'll talk about is kind of the governance question, uh, uh, because this is such a difficult issue for a president to execute on, given how uh, central a number of these issues are in terms of governing, and how do you put together a new administration effectively in that regard. I think we've We've got some uh, uh, interesting perspectives there. So let me quickly um, introduce uh, Jim Connaughton and, and Kate Gordon. Uh, their bios are on the conference website, so uh, per usual, I'm going to give them a little bit shorter shrift than they deserve. Um, for, for Jim, Jim and I crossed paths many years ago as young environmental lawyers cutting our teeth on the Clean Air Act, and I guess here we are again. But uh, You kept your hair. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it used to be brown, though. Um, both of you talked about, in different ways, the um, incredible diversity of sectors of the economy that are impacted by what we're talking about today, and the need for coordination and, and um, sort of everyone uh, falling in line in terms of trying to row in the right direction. How can, you, how can the next president effectively set up the White House and the agencies to um, avoid what is increasingly the common challenge that government has, which are so many cooks uh, at the White House potentially, and certainly a lot of agencies that may, particularly on a shiny object program like this, may go their own way. Um, well, you know, uh, it's a great question and the question. This is a multi-sector economy-wide issue, right? And, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, coordinating people, right? Whether it was getting labor and environment and business together at the Apollo Alliance or getting all these, you know, former secretaries of things together with the Rizzi Business Project. And, uh, and often as the youngest, not sadly, not anymore the youngest person in the room, I used to be, um, but often the only woman in the room. And so I'm often in the note taker role. And what I've learned in this role is that there's a lot of power being the facilitator you can actually shape a conversation as the facilitator. And so I, I think it's an interesting moment, you know, Jennifer Granholm talked about this as well, for the White House for sure to take a role of coordinating the conversation, not just bringing people together physically, but actually active, actively coordinating a conversation to figure out, to look at all these programs, look across all these agencies, figure out where the levers are, and, and, and try to uh, uh, find those common points of intersection. The other thing I would say about this is that, um, and this is a plug for my, my favorite agency, um, the Department of Commerce sort of is the youngest person in the room, right? <laughs> I mean, and often in the note-taker role. And I think commerce has a real opportunity here. I'm going to put in a plug for the Department of Commerce as a coordinating agency. They have the Economic Development Administration, so they're already cross-sector, they're already cross-region, they have people operating below the state level all over the country. They have the Manufacturing Extension Partnership doing technical support to manufacturing. They have the Small Business Administration, and they have the NASA satellites. They've got all of these different things that can be helpful to the macro and micro level on climate change and a real opportunity to sort of be in the middle, figuring out how to implement this at all kinds of different levels. So I would just put in a plug for not overlooking commerce as an important part of this conversation. Noted, noted. <laughs> Jim? Hmm. Um, well, I've got a little bit of experience in intergovernmental coordination, um, and it can work really well. And there's other times it doesn't work really well. Where it works well is if you're focused on a goal and you've got a fairly bite-sized thing you're aiming at. And in this space, it doesn't matter what, what issue we're talking about, there are you know, 12 agencies in the room plus all kinds of others in the room. So it's, this is a team sport, and it's a big team sport. Um, now, if you follow the path that I'm suggesting, that's a easier, it's an easier interagency process. It's a harder set of decisions to pull out, back out, and simplify, okay? Because people are giving up a lot of power in return for a much bigger yield. 
Okay, but that pays off, and that can occur. If you just take the tax set of examples I gave, there's really good effective processes for reaching decision on that and for negotiating that in the Congress. I have no worries about that functioning and functioning well if the new president decides they want to go after those three huge areas of, of, of unleashing capital for, for new energy investment. So, so that one's kind of an easy one. The power plant one is, um, is, is really um, ugly and hard, but much less ugly and hard than the complete mess of what the clean power plant is, is causing. By the way, very well intentioned, the best that could be constructed given the, given, the, given the statutory tools available, but it's still state by state by state by state, and then these attempts to create regional cap and trade systems to bypass the federal challenges. I mean, it's, it's the ultimate in, in, in sort of, uh, it's, it's what made the SIP process so challenging that you and I worked on uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s. Uh, we know how that is the least best solution to go after. It's what we've got. Now, if you could, if you could just say, all right, wave a flag, say, we get it, it's coming, it's messy, just like we did with air pollution, and just like Bill did with the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, um, and... Uh, and say, all right, we see that that's bad, we understand this is what we have to do, let's just do it simple and smart. I think there's common ground in that. And, and by the way, and then everyone's pointing at simplification as the exercise, not doing all the rent seeking associated with alternative pathways. Just one more really quick thing on this, and, and you talked about it, so it's, this is really parroting you, but the data issue is a big one. Um, and we do, I mean, those of us who do economic research look at the BLS data all the time. We look at the Bureau of Economic Analysis data. They, we need a data repository that everyone talks about measurement and verification. We need to be able to measure and verify something and then have a repository where we can all access those numbers. Mm -hmm. And that should be a government function. And ideally, it's a cross-administration function. It's not tied to a political agenda. Won't happen. Ideally. Ideally. Well, that so, won't <laughs> so, so, Jim, it won't happen, but... So we all are, think it should way. happen, I think so, I think, so I think, how, how would you make it happen? I think it's critical, but the issue is every agency owns their budget and their congressional committee and their particular methodology. Um, it, it's hard enough to just get three of them in the room to try to get them around a consolidated sensitivity analysis. Yeah, but you don't give up, though, do you? I mean, what... Well, no, I actually think, um, you know, take cueing off of what Andy Carson said earlier. I mean, the crowd here, you know, is just going to bypass the government process. I don't need the government for that. I mean, that's good. I mean, everything's getting censored. Um, everything's being socialized. Um, this, the data issue is going to be solved out in the world, not in the government. The government may organize it, put some standards around it, but I, I wouldn't wait for government on the data piece. I want to focus on actions and let's, let the umpires but come But it does later. need to be open. The problem is a lot of it's happening in the private sector and is closed. We need some kind of open source, some kind of agreed upon standard here, some benchmarking. Believe me, if you have something of the scale of what I'm proposing, uh, the measurement methodologies are going to follow because now you're actually trying to, you're, you're, choosing, you're choosing the least cost solutions and there will be a desperation for better measurement technologies rather than let's wait for the measurement technology before we, you know, feel that it can form good actions. <laughs> By the way, I'm a huge fan of data and measurement and verification. Don't get me wrong. It's just if you wait for it, we'll never be there. So uh, final question because we're going to stay on schedule here. Um, but a, a follow-up because, Jim, you mentioned this. And, and I, let's, let's go out to the international uh, uh, ramifications here, um, uh, and Kate, you talked a lot about, uh, very persuasively, I think, about how some of the bedrock industries are, are global, and if we can have a cleaner uh, base for them, um, and so we want, we, want, we want industry sectors to be moving toward uh, lower carbon uh, platforms, um, and, and somehow we want to, to get countries that are now making commitments um, to, to be able to share information from each other, maybe sectors to be able to work together with leaders helping to set standards and approaches and all of that. Um, and, and maybe they can also help with the measurement and verification of, of reduced carbon. Um, so um, let me ask you first, Jim, uh, because I know you've talked about this a little bit. What, what do you see as a potential architecture there that that might benefit um, both domestic and international approaches here to, to, uh, on a kind of a sector basis? Um, well, Secretary Schultz said it correctly. Uh, we know how to do this internationally. It was done with the Montreal Protocol. Uh, that's an area in which I have also some fair amount of experience, as do you. Um, the construct of that is an annual process that's sector-based and substance-based by which there is a neutral process of economic reasonability, I'm sorry, of technological feasibility of different 
approaches, and then the economic reasonability of those approaches. They put the two together, and, and revised goals are set every year. Okay, it's a living process. It's worked. It's, it's, it's quite astounding, and it's caused you know, the fastest, cheapest reductions of a very, a very important a pollutant that's also a greenhouse gas. And so that can work. There's been deep resistance to employing that methodology uh, in the climate change process by often the same government negotiators. The ones that are in the Montreal Protocol are the same people that are doing climate change. And yet the process over here is utterly different than the process that's worked over here. I would do no more. And, and don't tell me it can't be done because it was done. Don't tell me that the scale of carbon is bigger than ozone. It's, uh, sure, it's more, it's more amount, but it's actually fewer sectors, okay, and, and, and the capacity to do it. When it comes to power, that's 50% of the problem. We have all the technologies we need today to at least hit the Paris mark. I don't need to invent a single new one to do that. With respect to land use, we have all the technology today to hit the land use mark. That's just government will, good governance, and the things you described, David. And on, on, on transportation, we do need some, some technology advances, but that's 20%. If I, can get, if I can get 50 plus the 20 on land use and then get, you know, reap re 5 or 10 from transportation on the existing technology stack before we get to the new stuff that, that you know, Arun and, and, uh, um, and, uh, and Steve and others have worked on, I don't understand what we're waiting for. I mean, the technologies are there. Yep. Uh, deploy them. Final word, Kate. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I, th I agree with a lot of that. I think uh, policy, just integration is really important. So we, I do a lot of work on China now with Hank Paulson. And one thing we're seeing there is this, this, this uh, mismatch between air quality and climate goals. So uh, Beijing as a region, the Beijing, Hebei, Shenzhen region has air quality standard goals that they have to meet. And Beijing's mayor, to meet those goals, is moving factories, closing them down in Beijing and moving them to Hebei next door. That meets his air quality goals. That meets the standards. But it doesn't do anything on climate goals. I mean, maybe you get a slightly more efficient factory because it's newer. We have to integrate these goals. And one nice thing about carbon, I mean, it's very challenging, but it also creates four global mechanisms because it is a global problem, much like ozone. You have to look at it globally. And I would just say we have to make sure that those other environmental standards that we're talking about aren't actually in conflict. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jim.